So hello and welcome. Um, yeah, you can scan the QR code if you want to join our Discord. Uh, but I'm Beach. Uh, this is going to sound weird to the people on site, but for the purposes of the recording, um, I'm Beach with Code Soul. Okay, so um, we do IT education in the Greater Seoul area, and uh, today we're going to go over how to teach, uh, mostly because we want to encourage people within Code Soul and even outside to share knowledge and teach. And some people want to present, but they're not really confident about their skills. So we're going to try to solve that today. And hopefully it works. <laughs> um, so quick disclaimer. Um, this is based on my personal knowledge. Um, I am not an expert. I have not written a book on this stuff. Uh, this is just the skills and strategies that I have learned and that have worked well enough for me. Uh, so your mileage may vary. Um, you may want to uh, kind of uh, read some supplemental material. I do have references uh, to, especially some of like the neuroscience and anthropology stuff I have in here. Um, so feel free to check that out. And as always, if you have questions or debates or whatever, we're on Discord, we can chat. I'm very open to critical feedback, all that good stuff. So today the plan is we're going to go over targeting your audience, right? So kind of understanding who your audience and then how to handle that. Uh, going over a general model of knowledge, how do humans acquire information? Then we'll go over tricks for encouraging memory and understanding. Okay, so once I've told you something, how does it stick in here? And then also how do you make sure that it works with the rest of your knowledge? Uh, and then we're gonna go over general presentation skills and we'll end with kind of uh, strategies and tips for maintaining audience attention and caring for the audience. Okay. Any questions about today's agenda before we get started? Cool. Much more participation than previous classes. <laughs> so this is great. <laughs> All right, so uh, first targeting your audience. Um, first, kind of establish a baseline level of knowledge for your audience. Now, we kind of skipped that with this. Or I guess I kind of did it a little bit. Like I was asking you what your background is, these kinds of things. Um, but that, that helps to kind of understand what level you need to explain things at, right? So let's say you're explaining machine learning, which is a very advanced uh, computer science topic, and most of your audience is English teachers. You probably don't want to go too heavy on the math, right? Um, or if you do, you want to explain it very clearly, as cleanly as you can, and then kind of box it up and then build on top of it, right? Um, so make sure to kind of on, take a little bit of time, if you can, to identify and kind of understand the base level of knowledge that your audience has. Um, once you've done that, you're going to find that some people are going to be more advanced, some people are going to be more beginner, and it can be a bit jarring, like, well, how do I make everyone happy? And the simple answer is you don't. The more complex answer is you can get pretty close if you're careful. Uh, but as kind of a starting point, you want to tailor the information, you want to kind of customize things to go for the people with the lowest level of knowledge in the group. Unless, you know, all of this depends. If you have a group of like 200 people and it's like two people are lower skill, eh, you don't want to, you don't want to bring the whole thing down, right? Um, so, so be, be smart about it, right? Um, and if you are worried about losing more advanced people when you're targeting the kind of lower knowledge people, we're going to talk about that later, okay? Because I know that question's going to come up. Um, and then once you've identified that kind of lowest level of knowledge, you want to target that and then build up to the point where you're actually trying to teach people stuff. So going back to the machine learning example, um, machine learning is really hard to teach without math, without statistics. So you want to say, this is what the statistics concept is. This is why it's used. There's all this other stuff that's useful to know, but we're only covering this. And then you build on top of that to get to your target area. OK, that's a bit abstract, but does it make some amount of sense? Cool. Um, now, the key part with this is don't skip things. And that sounds easy, but it's really hard. For example, uh, in the past, we did a lot of very beginner classes, right? So teaching Python, teaching Java from scratch. Like you've never written, written a line of code before. Hello world is magic, right? Um, 
So when you're teaching at that level, it's really hard to explain what a variable is. It's wildly difficult, right? Because an experienced engineer, a variable is like taking a step, right? You don't even think about it, you just do it. But when it comes to teaching more advanced concepts, or when your audience is very new to the domain of knowledge that you're teaching, it's very easy to skip those steps if you're not careful. So make sure to check your assumptions and don't skip things. Otherwise, you're gonna lose everyone. <laughs> so it's something to keep in mind. But on that note, what you want to do is you want to find someone who you think is probably in the lower band, the kind of lower level of what your target group is, and then try the presentation with them. And they go, sorry, uh, wh what's a variable? <laughs> then you'd be like, right, I'm gonna explain that. Okay, does that make sense? Great, any questions about the slide so far? Cool, so. Sorry, a little time check here, yep. So this presentation is a little bit shorter than my previous presentations. We're not, probably not going to take the full two hours, but I anticipate there will probably be a bunch of questions, so we'll have plenty of time for that, and I encourage discussion, as you'll actually see later in here, okay? All right, so going forward. Did it actually go? No. Okay. Um, so consider the qualities of your audience too, right? So for example, engineers, like learning computer science messes with your head. It completely changes the way you think. Certain things no longer make sense and other things are obvious. And that's true of many different knowledge domains. Uh, for example, marketing looks at people wildly differently than engineering does, than HR does, right? So you wanna take into account how First off, what the composition of your audience is, right? What types of people are they? What their backgrounds are, what their knowledge is. And think about how they will think about the knowledge, which is weird, right? And it's kind of hard to explain. So you kind of want to imagine being them, imagine having their knowledge, imagine having their background, and trying to see what you're teaching through their eyes. Does that make sense? That's a bit of a difficult concept to explain. And in, in at least American English, we say try to picture it from their shoes. Um, but I don't know if that metaphor holds here. <laughs> um, another thing, too, is uh, since this is kind of a generic teaching thing, um, consider age as well. For example, kids will pick up topics much more quickly uh, if you make them very simple. They can, like, you tell them a simple thing, they got it. You don't need to tell them again. You, do another simple thing on top of it, they got it. And you can just keep stacking, and they'll just keep getting it. Whereas adults, they can handle more complexity, but it takes a little bit more effort for them to get it. So with adults, you take larger steps, right? With kids, you take a bunch of tiny steps, right? Um, now granted, I have not worked with children a huge amount, so I'm not super confident about that, but that's been my experience. Um, also, when it comes to kind of the social groups, take note of people who are alone and people who are in groups. Because when people are in groups, if one person doesn't understand something, they can go, what did that mean? To their friend. Whereas if they're alone, you're the only person that can help them, right? So take note of people who come alone, hi, and make sure to help them when they need help. We've done this a lot. And it's, I, I would like to think it's worked out, but. Um, so, and do be aware that when you have a group of like mostly people who came alone, you will need to spend a little bit more time supporting. So make sure to kind of budget your time accordingly, okay? Um, and then if you don't know people's level of knowledge or the qualities, like what their background is, ask. Like I asked Minji earlier, okay? Does that make sense? Great. Uh, any questions about this? all the gears turning for a second, so I pause. Um, I, and that reminds me of another point that I forgot to put in the presentation, but I'll add it in the appropriate place. So that's pretty much it for uh, targeting your audience. Um, the, the concepts are quite simple, but implementing them is a challenge, right? Um, because like these, it's what? 
we have six bullet points about. But each of these is like, you know, how do you establish a baseline level of knowledge when you have 20 people, right? Or how do you figure out, like, uh, maybe you're an engineer and it's a non-engineer that you're teaching, how do you kind of, okay, how do you kind of imagine their perspective, right? Conceptually, these are easy, but in practice, they're hard. So I strongly recommend muting Cacao Talk. So strongly recommend basically practicing, right? Uh, the first time you teach, let's be honest, it's going to suck. But if you go into it knowing that, it's not so bad. You expect to suck, you end up sucking, okay, that's fine. Okay, does that make sense? Cool. So... Moving on to what I think is the fun part, um, a model of knowledge. Now, this is a combination of some research that I've read about with kind of some extrapolation from that research, okay? So some of it's neuroscience, some of it is anthropology. This is fun stuff. If I start going on tangents, be like, yo, stop please, okay? Um, so first, uh, the neuroscience part of it. Um, and some vocabulary. So, uh, are you guys familiar with what a neuron is? Okay, a little bit of hesitation in some places. So, you have a brain, right? Your whole body is made up of stuff. Your body is made up of cells, basically tiny units that work together to make you. Um, your brain is also made of cells. Neurons are the cells of your brain that do the thinky parts, okay? And all of your, your entire nervous system, right? Uh, so, when you have an idea, when your brain tells your mouth to say things, when you do flailing motions, right? That's all neurons sending signals to each other to make stuff happen, right? Um, and the neurons work as a network, right? One neuron is stupid. It's, it gets some input, it develops some electric charge, it sends some output. That alone is not useful or interesting or capable, but when you put a whole bunch of them together, you get this thing, okay? Um, and then synapses are the connections between neurons, okay? So if neurons are useless alone and you have to connect them, synapses are those connections. So far so good? Cool. Baseline level of knowledge is established. Um, so some cool part that people way smarter than me have figured out is that most, or right now the current main theory of memory is that memories are not physical. Okay, they're not like, oh, your brain created a new neuron and latched it in here and those two together make a memory. That's not how it works. Memories, so I mentioned that neurons talk to each other. They send messages to each other to make things happen, right? Memories are patterns of neurons firing with each other, right? And then repeating. These neurons repeating make a memory, okay? So hold on to that idea for a minute. Okay, we're gonna come back to it. Um, and then when these memories are retrieved, when your brain kind of accesses that pattern and observes that pattern to recall a memory, okay? Each time that memory is recalled, the brain kind of thinks, it's a weird way to say it, but the brain kind of thinks, hey, this memory has been accessed again. It must be important. Let me give more energy to it so that the memory persists, so that the memory won't disappear over time, right? Because you forget things over time. That's basically the brain going, eh, this memory hasn't been accessed in a while. I'm just gonna take that energy away and put it towards something else, okay? So by remembering things, you're strengthening those memories. Um, so far, so good? Cool. I promise this will be useful in the end. <laughs> uh, so, last bit of neuroscience. Um, an interesting thing about memories, too, is their length, right? So these patterns, right, they can overlap, they can cross, right? So the same neuron can participate in other memories as well, like 10, 20, I don't actually know how many. Now, one neuron may participate in many, many memories, right? Because the neuron itself isn't what matters, it's the pattern of neurons, right? So neurons can be shared amongst memories. And that makes an interesting thing because if memories are patterns and memories are strengthened uh, by giving more energy to them, then if you take a strong memory and you kind of link that memory to another memory, 
that new memory will be stronger because it's reusing the infrastructure made by the first memory, right? So to that end, um, mem memories that are linked are stronger. And your mind, or your brain rather, um, associates memories with each other in kind of three key dimensions, space, time, and narrative, oddly enough. Right? So that's why like, you can have one story and then you're reminded of a related story. right? Or you can remember events in sequence very clearly. Right? Or you can remember, oh yeah, in, in the, at the Lunet Lecture Hall there was this other event too. Right? Because your brain is wired to kind of link these memories and share the infrastructure between these memories according to space, time, and narrative. Does that make sense so far? Cool. Questions so far? Because this is probably very new stuff to some folks. Cool. Um, so I, for, for those of you who have not been here that often, or, or it's your first time, uh, I tend to wait an uncomfortably long amount of time when I ask for questions, uh, because some people need a minute for the knowledge to settle, then they need to think, oh, I have a question, oh, I need to form it into words, I don't want to say it, uh, oh, it's awkward, and I'll say it, okay? So I wait that long, basically. Um, so moving on from the neuroscience, onto some anthropology, uh, early humans, uh, when I say early humans, um, it's kind of funny because early is relative for most of human history, or rather before the history part, for most of the human species before we started writing stuff down, we were hunter-gatherers, right? We went and found berries, and we went and hunted animals. And stuff. Now the way we hunted animals was we basically walked them to death, right? We were terrifying. Have you seen those movies where like the bad guy doesn't like chase after you very quickly, he just kind of saunters after you, but he's still really scary because like, you think you're safe, and then you turn around and he's there again. We were that. <laughs> um, so we would, like, chase gazelle or whatever for miles and miles and miles and miles until the point where they just couldn't run anymore, and they just fall over and be like, well, all right. That was us. So when your lifestyle is chasing things over long distances or going and foraging for things to eat, right, Keeping track of where you went and how long it took you to go there and basically the routes and all that stuff, basically the space and time stuff, right? That's kind of critical to being able to do that successfully. So that's kind of where this, um, it's the common explanation for why our brain works in these ways, okay? Now that's less directly useful, um, but it is indirectly useful for reasons you'll find out in a minute. Um, Yeah, I explained a lot. So any questions about this stuff so far? Cool. All right. Um, so what does all this mean? So first off, knowledge must be connected, right? Because memories are inherently connected at the physical layer, right? Or rather, I guess the electrochemical layer, but you know, whatever. Um, so on that note, memories must be anchored to other memories, okay? When you're hearing this stuff, right, you are linking it to other memories you have. When it comes to the anthropology side of things, right, you've probably seen photos of, you know, um, gazelle, right, photos of Africa. Imagine people running through the plains, right? These are memories you've had from your sensory input. You've seen the stuff on TV or photos and books or whatever, right? But you can take those memories and link them to what you heard here, right? And that allows you to remember these things better, okay? Because again, memories are all connected. The more links you can establish between memories, the stronger the memory will be. Um, additionally, repetition is key, right? Because every time the brain accesses a memory, it re gives more energy to that memory for it to persist longer. So remembering things, reviewing things, as you probably observed in school, reviewing things helps you remember them better, right? And connecting knowledge via space, time, and narrative also leads to stronger memories for the same reasons that I just described. Okay, so I'm basically summarizing what we just said. All good so far? Great, so now, I actually don't remember what the next part is. 
Yeah, okay. So, um, using this knowledge of neuroscience, what are tricks we can use to promote memory and understanding? When you are teaching people, how do you get them to remember what you taught them? Because if I tell you a whole bunch of interesting stuff here, you understand it, you leave, and then you forget all of it, we just wasted two hours, right? So you want to make sure that the people you're teaching remember. I have a question. Yes. Uh, can you go back to Absolutely. The connecting knowledge by a space time and narrative. Mm. Yeah, I can understand about time and narrative. Mm. So when we thinking about the situation uh, that we need to memorize something, we do uh, a lot of repetition, we spend a lot of time. We sometimes we create some maybe just uh, uh, imaginary uh, story, mm. but I don't understand about the space. Mm -hmm. So in that kind of situation, the space mm. works in what sense, in which way? Mm. So in my experience, there's two ways, two, two key ways at least. I'm sure there's a whole bunch of others, but it, what I've found in my history is just two key ways. One is when you demonstrate things spatially, right? If I say, here's a concept, right? You can imagine a concept, right? And then I can say, here's concept A, right? You can imagine an A on this thing, right? And I can, you know, say, now here's concept B, right? Maybe it's more of a box, right? You can imagine these objects in space right here, right? And, you know, this is all abstract. There's nothing here, right? But you can take this abstract concept and imagine it as a physical construct. And then you can connect them, right? Or you can use them to build other things. Right now, in my in your mind, you probably just imagined you know the ball connected to the cube, right, and then they move together over here. But there's nothing here, right? There's, it's just air. Um, but because our brains are grounded in this physical 3D reality, thinking about things in spatial terms helps us understand and remember them a little bit better, right? Um, it's easier to visualize connections to things rather than just imagining connection, right? Uh, so that's one way. The second way is uh, we strongly associate memories with places. So going back to kind of the hunter-gatherer thing, right? Or even forgetting the hunter-gatherer thing, thinking about uh, today, imagine your drive to and from work, or if you don't drive your bus, train ride, whatever, your way to and from work, right? you might have memories associated with certain checkpoints along your route, right? Because we are wired, based on our history, to associate memories and ideas with certain locations, because that helps us find our way home, okay? Um, similar thing if you go back to, like, the house you grew up in, right? And you see objects around. Or if you just imagine the house that you grew up in, you can recall memories with certain objects throughout the place. Right? And that helps your recall. Right? Whereas if you try to recall that memory without any other kind of anchor, I mean, there is no anchor. You're not going to be able to retrieve that memory. Does that make some sense? Right, 100%. But if you're talking about just a general memory about any type of event, mm. that's perfectly fine. It's mm. understandable. But mm. uh, when you think about just uh, studying some topics or studying some maybe specific area, mm. it's a uh, or just abstract things, mm -hmm. in that case, mm -hmm. we cannot apply the space thing. Mm -hmm. We are just uh, sitting uh, on the chair. Mm -hmm. We don't move. Mm -hmm. We just reading a book. Mm -hmm. We have to memorize some this uh, knowledge and concept. Mm -hmm. The title is not model of knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. We need to memorize a lot of knowledge. Mm -hmm. In that case, how this space can help mm -hmm. help, uh, help for us? So, good question. So when it comes to the teaching aspect of things, um, uh, yeah, this is why I'm not happy with the structure of this presentation, like I mentioned earlier, because if I had designed it properly, I would have answered that question in like the next slide, but I didn't. Um, so there's a couple of ways. The probably easiest way is through metaphors or common memories, right? So. 
for example, let's say, let's say I'm teaching something and I'm using food as a metaphor, right? And maybe I can kind of describe that thing in terms of food and relate it to when you were a child at home and your parents would bring food to the table, right? So in that way, I can kind of anchor that memory to a childhood experience you have, right, of eating food at the table with your family. Um, now, that's a, that's a bit of a stretch because this is the first time I've presented this and my metaphors are probably not excellent. Um, but you could also do something like um, if you hold, and this is something I kind of wanted to do with code soul, but it would get really expensive, um, is if you hold events, at, or if you do different activities and learn different things at different places, you can basically associate that memory with that place, right? So, for example, maybe you've gone out with friends somewhere, and you only went out there once or twice, right? But your friend has, says, hey, remember uh, we did that thing? And you're like, what thing? And they say, oh, at that place. They're like, oh, I remember that place. Oh, now I remember that thing, right? So that's actually one of the downsides of using space is that if there's one place that you're learning a whole bunch of stuff in, all the memories get kind of clumped together and it's hard to pick out one of the memories if you built a whole bunch of memories in one place, right? So like if I ask you to recall every single Code Soul event you've been to in this room, you're gonna have a bit of trouble, right? Um, so that's kind of the downside of it. Um, but when it comes to teaching, uh, the, the way that I found best for using it to your advantage is through metaphor. So finding some common memory that most people will have and then linking it to that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Or if, um, hmm. so this is just, I'm coming up with this one on the fly. Um, if uh, I, I have no idea what Korean schools are like, I've never been to Korean school, but uh, in, the, in the US, a lot of physics and chemistry teachers will often bring in props, right? And they'll bring in objects for, to teach specific lessons, right? And you'll find that many students remember those lessons very clearly because there was a physical aspect to them, right? There was a thing in space. You'll be like, oh yeah, remember when he did the balloon thing? And they're like, oh yeah, balloon. And you can envision that balloon and you can remember seeing what the teacher did with that balloon, right? So if you have props or if you have certain activities that you do, right, that can work. And the great part is you can combine all of this. So what I can do is I can remind you of the ball that I made and how I put the ball up here. I made the cube as well. I put it up here. I connected them. I moved them over here, right? And now by repeating this thing in space and associating that memory with you being here, Right? That memory might be a little bit stronger than any other memory you've had in this place. Because A, it's using space. B, it's I'm explicitly associating it with this space. And C, I've repeated it. So that's actually kind of the dangerous side to this. Um, there's also something called neuro linguistic programming, which is super scary. Super, super scary. Um, but you can kind of hack people's brains and get them to remember things in certain ways or get them to think in certain ways based on how you describe things and how you associate it with recent events, the space, and kind of the story that they're going through right now. But don't go too deep down that rabbit hole, it's super scary. But does that make sense so far? Any other questions about that stuff? Yeah. Are you talking about the case where you're in one place learning many different things yeah. and trying to distinguish the individual memories? Yeah. Uh, mm. So. Yeah, I'm going to get to it later. Yeah. 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 I was trying to avoid talking about it, but I think I can't avoid it at this point. So yeah, thank you. So there is um, an idea of the palace of memory, 
It's also called the method of loci, loci, loci? I don't know, it's Greek. Um, but basically, in ancient Greece, they had the epic poets, right? Or the big one that everyone talks about is Homer, right? The Iliad, the Odyssey. Does anyone recognize any of these words? One, two, okay. So in ancient Greece, there were these uh, poets who would tell these really, 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 really long stories, right? And they didn't use a book. It was all up here, right? And we're talking stories that would take like four, five, six hours to tell. So you're like, how do you, how did they memorize stories that took that long to tell? They figured out a method, basically relating to this. They figured this stuff out without the neuroscience side of it. Um, they went to the local temple in their city, because the Greeks had a lot of temples to all these different gods. So they had a whole bunch of these different places that were not going anywhere for a long time. Like, they're not gonna tear down and rebuild the temple. The temple's built, it stays, right? So they would walk through the temple and they would pick stuff out, and they'd think about a part of the story and associate it with that part in the temple. And they'd walk to the next part, and they'd take the next part of the story and associate it with that part of the temple, and they basically walk through this temple, or palace, whatever you want to call it, and associate memories in a story with specific parts of the temple. So they were using all three parts of memory, time, space, and narrative, because they were memorizing a narrative walking through a space sequentially in time. Okay. So that's, if your space allows you to kind of like move around it, you can use that. And that's wildly effective based on history. I haven't done it so much because my head's a little weird. Because um, I think like, I'm really good with abstract space, so I don't need to do that so much. But um, that's one method. If you can't like walk around a space and associate memories with different place locations or objects in the space, um, now this is just a guess. I haven't tried it. I haven't tested it. But maybe you could modify the space in some way. Like maybe you could bring some object and put it in the space and be like, today there's this object. I'm going to associate it with that memory. Uh, especially if that object is portable, because then maybe you could bring it to wherever else you need to remember the fit. Right? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like having like cheat notes, but no notes, just some kind of memory thing. I should associate memories with these. <laughs> I already have. Um, so yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah. Cool. Other questions? Cool. All right, so going forward, um, how do we use all this knowledge? Uh, to actually teach people? How do we use these as kind of tricks to encourage memory and understanding? So first off, repetition. Hey, guess what? I'm gonna repeat repetition a lot. Be ready for it. Um, but you don't wanna repeat it just again, 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 again. You wanna have a little gap in time, right? Because the mind needs to kind of go away from that memory before recalling it again and be like, because otherwise it'll think it's just thinking through the same memory again. You need to step away from it. And then when you recall it later in time, then it will dedicate more resources to it, okay? Um, also, more context actually helps memory, as long as it's relevant. For example, that neuroscience and anthropology stuff, you did not need to know that at all, right? But there's a pretty high chance that that knowledge is related to some other kind of memory you have, right? Or maybe you can visualize it in a certain way, right? And it creates a kind of context for this memory to live in. And because memories are based on connection, the more things you can connect a new memory to, the stronger the memory will be. Now there's a limit to that, right? You don't want to overload someone. But adding context to a memory, adding more information can actually help you remember things better, as long as it's structured in space and time and narrative properly, okay? So far, so good. Um, now, on that note, uh, to kind of counterbalance that, you need to make sure that knowledge is bite-sized, right? So presentation slides are actually great for this. Um, and this is actually kind of terrible. There's too much text here. It's too much information in one place, right? But that's one of the advantages of presentations, is presentations only give you so much space to fit information, 
right? They constrain you to keep things small. That's good. That's why presentations are so popular. They're a great way to exchange information. Um, so you want to establish knowledge as discrete individual pieces of inf information and then connect them, okay? Because again, connection is the key. Um, also, if you want to get a bit more onto the neuroscience side of things, um, we have working memory, short-term memory, and long-term memory, okay? Working memory is what's on your mind right now, what you're actively thinking about, okay? Working memory is very fast, right? You can recall and generate new information very quickly, right? But you have very little working memory, very, very, very little, okay? For those more in the IT portion, um, working memory is basically RAM, okay? So you need to be aware that working memory is limited and don't overload it, right? That's why we do bite-sized chunks, small, small, small chunks of memory. Um, and then you want to focus on connecting things. So far, so good? All right. Um, and then make sure knowledge, I should have made this a bigger portion. You need to make sure knowledge is layered. Right? So, Minji, for example, in school, you probably had like, no, I'm making some assumptions about Korean schooling. So if my assumptions are wrong, tell me like, no, that's not how it is. But I imagine probably early in your schooling, you had like life sciences, right? Which is like, this is a frog. They're part of the animal kingdom kind of stuff, right? Like when you were much younger. And then later in your schooling, they're probably like, yeah, here's the animal kingdom, here's frog, but also here's like phylum genus species kind of stuff, right? They gave you a baseline knowledge, level of knowledge earlier on, and then later, they built on that knowledge in layers each grade you went on, right? That's actually a really great teaching technique because, again, everything is connection, right? And if you repeat things with gaps in time, that memory becomes stronger, you link it to existing stuff, it works great, okay? Does that make sense? Cool. Um, questions about stuff here? Cool. Also, uh, for reference, I will post these slides on our Discord uh, if you want to reference them later. And I am recording this, so. But yeah. Ah, damn it. Um, right, so the method of loci, loci, loci. I have no idea how to pronounce that. Um, but kind of using space um, to explain concepts. We already talked about that. I'm not going to talk about it again. Uh, but just reminding you of the idea, reminding you of the memory is good enough for repetition. Um, but another thing is to think of your content as a story. Okay. Now, that doesn't always work. For example, with this, does not work. I tried. I tried to structure this as a narrative. It didn't work. So you can't always do it. But if you can, you should. Right? Um, because this is kind of, there's not really a sequence to this information. Like, there is a little bit, like establishing the neuroscience background and that. But if you can find a sequence to what you're trying to teach, putting it in more of a narrative format is really effective. Are you guys familiar with narrative format? Exposition, rising action, climax, falling action, resolution? Kind of. Kind of? Is anyone not familiar? How about that? Man, you guys were good students. <laughs> OK, cool. Um, so if, if you're not familiar with that, you can Google it, and you'll find it. You'll, you'll find it. Um, and then, that's right. This is where stuff kind of fell apart in the structure of this. Like, I was like, how do I structure things from here forward? Um, then if you can, teach by doing is excellent, right? Because when we talk about, you know, again, space, time, narrative, Right? The ultimate combination of those things is a person actually doing the thing. Because right? they're doing it at a point of time, in some space, and it's part of their life narrative. Right? So when you're teaching things, if you can turn it from a lecture into a workshop where the participants are actually doing stuff, that's way better. I couldn't figure out how to do it with this. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and then if you are able to uh, have your audience actually do the thing that you're trying to teach. Encourage experimentation. Um, that's not necessarily related to a whole bunch of the other contexts we've been establishing, but 
that's kind of more of a satisfaction issue because we have learned throughout human history by mostly trial and error, right? It's only in the past maybe two or 300 years that we started going, hey, I theorize that if I do this, then this other thing will happen, right? It's mostly been just experimentation. Uh, and so we're pretty well wired for that. Um, I put this on the wrong slide. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and I am failing at it already. Avoid filler phrases, don't say um, uh, that kind of stuff. Mostly because it breaks the flow. It's less bad if it's between concepts. It's less bad if it's between concepts, but in the middle of a sentence, when you're trying to explain some concept and adding some kind of filler kind of kills the flow, right? And it makes it more difficult to kind of package the memory into a bite-sized chunk because you have to remove all the filler and knit. Okay, does that make sense so far? So filler phrases are like um uh <coughs> in Korean it would be like uh oh, mm, like these kinds of things, right? Th that's basically filler phrases. Mostly really I should have put this in the presentation section, so that's my error. But it breaks the flow of delivering the information and it kind of breaks the, the memory generation process. So it's just something to be careful about. Basically, you want to kind of be thinking ahead. Even, I said kind of, is bad filler, right? You want to be thinking ahead of what you're going to say before you say it so that the words come out smoothly and you don't need those kinds of filler phrases. Does that make sense? I've been doing it like this whole presentation. <laughs> um, so, Uh, in English or Korean, like doesn't doesn't matter. Okay. It's one of those things where when you're not trying to do it, you're doing it all the time. Then you want to do it. Does it work? Um, like that big um right there is one example. Uh, when I say like a lot, that's another example of filler stuff. But filler phrases can be larger, and those are the more dangerous ones. Uh, smaller ones like uh, um, like, not so bad. But if you say, it's something kind of like when you, you could just say the thing, right? You don't need the something kind of like, right? It's just a whole bunch of, it's basically filling up a whole bunch of time so that your brain can catch up and figure out what you're trying to say. Does that make sense? Cool. You can tell I'm new to this material. So uh, this whole content is more um, like um, talking about just uh, memorizing a specific event and uh, experience and not about actual learning. So if, if you apply this whole maybe the idea to learn a JavaScript language, mm -hmm. how can you make this kind of narrative Space and you 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 explain mm -hmm. a lot, but how how can how could you apply mm -hmm. in that situation? You you now you need to uh, learn about JavaScript, mm -hmm. and maybe the syntax, mm -hmm. or the, you, you need to practice your maybe uh, this uh, new programming language. Mm -hmm. In that case, how can you apply mm -hmm. this tactics? So that indicates I made this way too generalized. So thank you. Uh, I sh probably should have made it more specific. But to answer your question, I'm going to kind of demonstrate it more in the presentation section uh, because I'm going to go through examples of implementing this while presenting things. But when it comes to programming, teaching programming specifically, a lot of it boils down to metaphors, especially with programming. Because programming is such a crazy abstract concept. Like, we don't think like computers at all. Thinking in terms of ones and zeros, this meat brain can't do that, right? The, the electronic brain, that's like the regular modus operandi. That's business as usual, right? But meat doesn't do ones and zeros. 
So usually to explain the abstract concepts in software, we have to use some kind of metaphor, right? And when we go into that metaphor, you need to be very careful with the mapping, right? So for example, if I explain a variable, I'll, I'll go ahead and go through the usual way I explain variables right now, just as an example. So a variable is a way to store information that can change for use later. Now that made zero sense, right? But if I say to you, think of a variable like a box, okay? This box is of a certain size, okay? And so I can fit something of a certain size into the box, okay? If the box is too small, that thing won't fit, right? If the box is too big, I've wasted a bunch of space, right? Additionally, this box can have a label on it, right? So I can see, oh, maybe the, the count of people in the audience is the data inside this box, right, via some label, right? So if I'm writing some JavaScript, right, and I say, you know, let number of people in audience equals five, what I have done is I've said, there's a box, right? It's variable, so it can change shape, right? Because I said let, right? Let indicates that it's a, it's a variable value rather than a constant value. And then I said number of people in the audience is the label, it's the name of the variable, so that's like the label in the box. And then I put the number five in the box, okay? So that's the spatial example I usually use for teaching variables. Um, and that involves like, you know, there's a bit of pantomiming in here, right? There's you know going through metaphor. There's going piece by piece, right? And I kind of laid it as a story, right? There was an exposition. I have a box. Let me explain to you. Here is a box, right? I have established this is the box. This is the topic of conversation, right? Then I've kind of built up, and you're like, okay, I'm starting. I'm understanding. I've got the idea of a box. I got the idea that the box can change shape, right? That's kind of you're you're building up. You're like, okay, I'm understanding this stuff. Feels good. Feels good. And then once you get to the point where you're connecting the code to all the exposition, exposition you've just done, you're like, oh, now I get it. That's the climax, right? And then after that, you kind of establish, you review things, right? That's the falling action, right? And then you say, now does that make sense? And everyone's kind of in agreement, and that's the conclusion. You can move on to the next topic. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. What explanation? Thank you. I've yeah. done that one a lot. <laughs> yeah. So in that example, so mm -hmm. another factor, mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. How time this time factor is applied in your example? Uh, not so much in that one. Not so much. Yeah. Um, yeah. You could argue that like the narrative happened through time, but and that feels like a cop out argument. That doesn't feel like a yeah, good argument. Except for the time, and that's a really great example of whole this explanation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for time, uh, no, not that one. No. Uh, I actually don't use time too much. Time is going to be more of, t time's a bit trickier because Usually when you're teaching, it's time box, right? You have a specific limited time. Uh, but that is one of the reasons why I like to go to dinner after events, because maybe you'll um, generate some kind of strong memory at the dinner, right? Maybe you'll have some very, very strong, strong, strong memory, or maybe it's related to something else. And then I can say, hey, remember when we did that teaching session? And they're like, teaching session. Well, like, well, we went out to dinner afterwards and we did this thing. And then you're like, oh, yeah. And then you can go back through time in your memory, <laughs> get back to the content of the um, So that's kind of a cheat, but it works. Does that make sense? But yeah, in, in my experience, time is actually the hardest to use, but it is useful to keep in mind. Other questions? How are we doing on time, actually? Oh, wrong. Too many. Oh, okay. Yeah, we're ahead like I expected. All right, so going forward. Ah, right, I did. I moved them around. Okay. 
Um, so going on to presentation skills, which that last bullet, bullet point should have been a part of. Again, repeat things, but not too closely together, right? Um, but when you do that, acknowledge that it's repetition, right? Don't just casually repeat it, because then they might think you're crazy. Like, dude, you've said this 10 times. You're like, yes, I know I'm repeating it, but it's because it's important. And I want to make sure you remember, right? Um, also, people kind of like being like, oh yeah, I do remember that. Cool, I, I think, feel like I actually learned it, okay? And then explain things in physical space, like with the box example and with the circle, with the connection, with this cube that I moved that is really gonna stick in your head in this place and time right now. But um, pantomiming, right, is really, really useful because you can make use of space, right? And pantomiming, you can do it anywhere, right? We could be in like a tiny little Taws cube room and I can do stuff here, right? Um, so you can draw something in physical space, or if you are using like, you know, a drawing whiteboard kind of thing online, you can do that. And don't just like, oh, here's a thing, here's a thing, ta da! No, be dynamic with it, right? Like move it through space. Um, that's right. Uh, there was another part I was debating whether to put it earlier to move it here, and I ended up just not writing it at all. Um, so another thing about kind of how our brains work. For better or worse, historically, we have been predators, okay? We have, we, we are trained where if something moves, we notice it because either it's a threat or it's something we want to eat, right? So when it comes to motion, we live in physical world. We are trained to react to motion, right? And so by using motion in your presentation, that does something at a very in instinctive level to us. It catches our attention, right? So you'll notice that when I talk about a really important point or I move into a different topic, like I'm actually moving, right? I either increase the energy of my actions or I move to a different location to signify that things have changed, right? Um, I'm gonna edit the presentation. I'm gonna add that in because I was debating whether or not to put it in, but whatever. Um, so, that actually goes nicely into the next point of be energetic, right? Um, be dynamic, because we're humans, right? We're not just machines like passively receiving information, okay? We like seeing people being energetic. We like doing stuff, right? Yeah, sometimes it's nice to just sit on the couch and sleep, but when people are happiest is when they're doing something, right? And we like seeing people be active and do interesting things. So be active and do interesting things, right? It'll help people pay attention. And then also be dynamic. Use intonation, right? Sometimes you get your voice really, really high and excited and like, oh man, this is really cool. Or maybe sometimes when you want to deliver a point and you want things to settle down and you want to bring an end to a concept, you make your voice a little bit lower. You slow your pace. You make your sentences smaller. These kinds of things. Does that make sense? Um, oh, and there was a physical space thing. I did it out of order. But anyway, um, yeah, so use physical space, walk around, move around, talk with people, move, move your hands, this kind of stuff, okay? Get some exercise, right? Any questions about this stuff? Feeling good? Cool. Um, ah, so, as mentioned previously, use metaphors and analogies. Um, now, this can be really hard, right? This is something that takes, um, unless you like have a background in writing or something, this takes a lot of practice. This is difficult because it's creative improvisation. Unless you do a lot of planning for your events. Um, I'm not great at planning stuff in advance. Um, well, in extreme detail, as Alana knows. <laughs> um, but. Most of them are fine, but um, you can kind of shore, the, shore up the skill by spending more time preparing, being like, okay, I've gone like five slides and no metaphor. That's a problem, right? Um, and when you do metaphors, keep your audience in mind, right? Like, for example, if I give some metaphor here about like an American Independence Day, Fourth of July thing, you guys are going to be like, 
I don't, I don't know American Fourth of July. Like that, that metaphor is useless to me. There's nothing I can. There's, I don't have any relevant experience to that. I can't link the memory to anything. But if I talk about something like Hangul Day or something, right? Maybe or Solal. Solal is much better. Um, if I do some metaphor related to Solal, right? That's something that you guys have experienced because you live in Korea or will experience. Um, so keep in mind whom your audience is when you're doing metaphors. Um, repeat things to strengthen memories. <laughs> I probably did that too soon. I should have moved that later. And then uh, be confident, right? Uh, going back to kind of our instinct, we are more attentive and attracted to, and I mean in like the literal definition, not like romantic attraction, but like we want to give our attention, we want to talk with, we want to be engaged with people or things or whatever that exhibit confidence and exhibit expertise, right? So if someone knows what they're talking about, you're like, yeah, I'm, I'm listening, yeah, yeah, tell me more kind of stuff, right? That should be you, right? And this is the very difficult part for people starting out teaching because they're nervous, right? But I'm actually really nervous right now because I know the quality of this presentation is not up to my normal standard, right? But I use that energy to instead do other stuff, right? And you can kind of fake confidence that way, right? Um, and in any case, if people have come to an event and the description is accurate, they've come to learn whatever it is you're going to teach. Right? So they're there for you. As long as you give them what they want, you'll be fine. And like 99% chance you're giving them what they want if your description of your event or description of whatever you're teaching matches what you teach. Right? So basically, be confident. Don't, don't teach like this. Right, body language matters. I'm, I'm not, I'm not going like, to be like a little mouse where I'm kind of afraid to share information with you. Try to stand up, work on your posture, <laughs> right? And try to speak with confidence. Does that make sense? Cool. I, I didn't say, uh, don't use gardening metaphors with physics. I was having a really hard time coming up with an example. like. If your audience is like theoretical physicists, mm -hmm. you don't want to do some metaphor based in gardening. Because they're going to be like, yeah, that was a terrible. Let me, let me I want to just change it now. But <laughs> um, the, I gave a better example earlier of like, if my audience is Korean people, I'm not going to use a metaphor about like American Independence Day. Because right? you haven't experienced that. You have no anchor to that metaphor. Right. right? Okay. That's what I meant. I'm going to change that later. Does that answer your question? Yes. Cool. Other questions? Cool. Um, so last section, uh, audience, attention, and care. First off, observe the audience. Um, notice that people seem lost or people, maybe some people are tired. Some people are kind of like, like using myself as an example. Sometimes I have trouble staying awake in meetings <laughs> because <laughs> Maybe the information is not relevant to me, and I only slept four hours last night, right? But a good presenter, a good speaker, will notice this and do something to try to draw that person back in. Um, usually by either finding something that they're interested in or asking them a question. Uh, but on that note, when you do that, try to be kind of subtle about it. Don't make it so obvious. Don't be like calling the person out. Maybe you and that person know what happened. But no one else needs to know, right? Um, and if people get lost, don't be afraid to ask them, like, hey, you look confused. Do you have a question about this? Is something concerning? And then they might, they might get nervous and clam up. Or they might go, yeah, what the hell did you just say? Kind of stuff. So don't be afraid to ask people if they're lost. Most of the time, they'll answer. Um, and then I mentioned previously that you want to kind of target uh, teaching at the lowest level of knowledge in a group and then kind of build up. 
when you do that, the more advanced people, they're gonna check out, right? They're like, I already know this stuff, I don't need to pay attention for this, right? And that's fine, right? They already know this stuff, you don't wanna waste their time. But when you have finished, you should get their attention. My hands are so cold, I can't even clap properly. Um, you want to do something to get their attention, right? You can either raise your voice again and be like, so, next we're moving on to so-and-so thing, right? And then they'll be like, wait, something changed. Why is he loud all of a sudden? And that's how you can kind of get their attention again, right? Um, oh, and obviously encourage questions, right? Like people are there to learn. Uh, if people feel comfortable asking questions, they're going to ask you questions. And you're teaching for them to get the knowledge, right? Asking questions is a method of getting knowledge. If you don't allow questions, you're depriving them, I lost the word for a second, depriving them of the ability to learn something in the way that they learn it. Because maybe they need the information structured in a certain way. For example, when Tom asked me about how do you use this time-space narrative thing, right? Because maybe he learns better by examples. And so I was able to give an example, I was able to tailor the teaching to match his method of learning, right? If he didn't feel asking, if he did not feel comfortable asking questions due to something I did, he wouldn't have been able to pick that up, right? So make sure you're very open to questions. Be a little bit aggressive about making sure people know they can ask questions. Because a lot of people are afraid to ask questions. They're afraid to look stupid or something like that. Does that make sense? Questions about this? Cool. Um, oh, big thing, don't be afraid to say I don't know, or even let's check together if you think you can find an answer in short order. Um, a lot of people don't like to do this because they're afraid it'll make them look stupid or make them look like they're not qualified to teach, but it usually has the opposite effect. Because if they're comfortable saying, I don't know, then the other stuff they've said, you can be confident they know it, right? Because the things they don't know, they've been like, I don't know that, I can't teach you that because I don't have the information, right? Whereas if they never say, I don't know, they could just be bullshitting you the entire time, and you would never know, right? Um, and people pick up on that. Um, and then respect your audience. So when people ask good questions, especially if they're kind of gaps in your teaching, uh, I, I forget who did it, but someone, someone asked a question earlier where um, I mentioned like, oh yeah, I didn't have something for that here, and then I kind of covered it. Um, that's good, recognize when people do that. Again, it encourages asking questions, and it encourages that you're open to feedback, which means people will give you feedback, and then you can be a better teacher. Everyone wins. And then welcome alternative answers. Uh, sometimes you might have someone who comes to your session to learn only a small part of the whole thing you're teaching, and that's fine, right? Because they'll, they'll learn that one part that they want to learn, but then they might try to correct you on other parts, right? And some people get a little bit insulted. They're like, wait, I'm the teacher, I'm the expert here, this person's undermining my authority. No, right? They're just worried that the, lear that the audience will learn the wrong thing, and they want to make sure they have the same objective as you. They want to make sure people have good knowledge. And engage them, be like, maybe you can have a quick little debate. Or maybe there's a gap in something you said and they filled it in, right? Be welcoming to that stuff, okay? Or if it's more of an experiential thing, be like, hey, that is an experience that that person has had. It might be totally valid. It's not been my experience. But now you have two sources to draw from, right? Welcome these alternative answers. Unless you know it's bullshit and then be like, hey, no, this is why that's not right. Um, but usually that's pretty rare. Usually if people speak up and correct a presenter, they're pretty confident about whatever they're speaking up in, speaking up about, but yeah. Um, and then on a related note, when people s start discussing things, because usually when an alternative answer comes in, people will start discussing it and debating it. Unless you're really pressed for time, don't stop them. Just let them, let them debate, let them talk about it. Unless things start to get heated, then you know, play moderator, get people to calm down. But usually that's not a problem. Uh, any questions about this stuff? Does that make sense? Cool. And then, is there? Wow, not bad. Um, 
So, given all that, um, that's the core contents of the presentation. We are going to have some discussion, but just to remind everyone, we talked about targeting your audience, thinking about like establishing the baseline level of information, um, targeting the lowest level of information, building things up for, you, for people, and then making sure to take care of your more advanced learners. We talked about a model of knowledge, how knowledge works from a neuroscience perspective and the background it has in anthropology and human history. We talked about tricks for encouraging memory and understanding, you know, like the method of loci, loci the memory palace, <laughs> um, and you know, being kind of dynamic, and, or no, that was later. Uh, you know, being repetitive, these kinds of things. Um, we talked about presentation skills, like using intonation, using pacing, using motion, these kinds of things. Uh, and then we talked about audience attention and care, basically taking care of your audience, encouraging questions, encouraging discussion, recognizing that they're here to learn. All right, so at this point, um, any open questions before we get into discussion? Also, I apologize it's so cold. I got here like 45 minutes early and turned on stuff to try to make it warm. It's very much not. <laughs> I'll try to get here earlier next time and turn on the heater. But uh, yeah, so. Um, I didn't have a strong plan for the discussion. I figured it would just kind of happen naturally and now I'm at a loss. Um, so. Has anyone here had experience teaching things to a larger group of people? Mm. I did some workshops and stuff like that. Oh yeah, I remember. Yeah, yeah from your resume. Final workshop. Mm. Is there anything missing that you feel like other people could benefit from hearing about? Mm. I don't think so. <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> that works. Um, but also, this stuff can be applied to one-on-one -on -one kind of stuff, too. Like oh, maybe, maybe something. Oh. Uh, I think in one of the rooms, the general girls work very well. Mm. I'm not sure if they do that everywhere, but we had a lot of people teaching, mm. not just one person. Mm. So they would ask, oh, who wants to volunteer? Like, older programmers or older students? And they would come and sit with maybe four people at most and would teach them, mm. teach them um, in a way that works for that, that group. Mm -hmm. So we could have like different kind of people learning in different ways mm. in the same room. Mm -hmm. And it did, it was totally different because some people follow the workshop right by the book because there are instructions on how to learn it. Mm. And other people know if they were to go like teach something else entirely, but people were learning something mm. uh, related to coding, so mm. it was too good. That's pretty good. So were those people associated? Like, were they already part of your volunteer group, or were they other attendees? Or uh, some were former attendees. Mm. Oh, they came twice to Venezuela, mm. and other people no, they mm. were just like uh, more experienced people that like. Mm. Yeah, so that's that's a good point. There have been times where we've also kind of split into smaller groups, and that works really nicely. Yeah. Especially because people are more comfortable asking questions in small groups. Mm. Like, for example, if there were 20 people here instead of six, you'd probably be a little more nervous to ask questions, right? Um, so yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. Mm. Um, so then, how did you encourage, uh, or rather, I imagine you probably encountered issues with getting people to kind of help teach, right? Yeah. How did you encourage volunteers? Mm. <laughs> um, the uh, Jungle Girls is really focused on women, mm. or minorities. Mm. We even expanded it and to other minorities too. Mm. So we talked a lot about. Uh, oh, remember when you were starting to learn and you didn't have any role models, you didn't have uh, anyone that could teach you, mm -hmm. and uh, how important it is to have someone to relate, and 
people would feel empathy. Mm. <laughs> That's pretty good. Mm. I also uh, talk, oh, you have so much experience. If you share with the world. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So. And it's okay. Oh, some people didn't even know jungle, you know. But mm. it's a person who has a lot of experience. Mm. So they are going to pick that up mm. and read and understand. Mm. So it's okay. It's like, no, you're like a senior programmer. You don't need to know. Right. So that, that brings up a good point. There have been... So we've had classes before where, like, you know, 40 people show up, and we're like, oh, no. <laughs> you only have one person running this event. But what you can often do is you can find helpers in the class, right? So, and they'll kind of make themselves known. Like, you'll be able to pick them out. They might ask a bunch of questions. They might ask alternative answers. For example, Tom. Do you remember the other Tom, the Polish guy? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we had uh, another guy, also named Tom, who he knew his stuff, right? <laughs> he just came to like fill in gaps or just for community purposes. And there are totally Toms who are just like, hey, hey, Tom, can you like help out this person? When we have like 20 people and there's only one instructor, right? Um, and that's super, super, super useful um, because. Ooh, I should add this for the presentation. Um, learning stuff alone sucks, right? Learning stuff alone is hard. Um, but learning in a community is actually a lot more helpful because you feel supported, right? That's right. That's damn it. So I remember when I was preparing the presentation, I, re I thought of this. And then I was like, oh, yeah, I need to put that in. And then I got distracted, and I forgot, and I couldn't remember it. Um, there's a reason you're all here right now. Right? A lot of this stuff you can find just by Googling. Right? Why did you come here? You came here because either you couldn't find it elsewhere, which maybe makes me a little sad, but whatever. Right? Um, or what's more likely is you wanted to learn from a human. Right? You wanted that sense of connection. And maybe you wanted to meet other people who also wanted to learn so that you could be supported so that you felt like you weren't in it alone. Maybe so that you could hold yourself more accountable, right? And as a teacher, you can make use of that, right? For example, we have a Discord server. There's a reason for that, right? We want people to be comfortable helping each other, right? Like in Alana's Django Girls group, encourage finding the helpers and encouraging them to help because they'll develop bonds with the other learners, right? Those people will feel more supported They'll feel more confident about their learning, right? They'll be more comfortable asking questions, right? And then they have another person to ask questions to. Because being a teacher is a bit of a burden, <laughs> right? Um, so yeah, thank you a lot. Does that make sense? Anyone have other questions or debate topics on that? Something I was thinking about is mm. some people have really hard time with metaphors. Mm. It's not for everyone. Mm. From the top of my mind, I remember it's like people who have outfits mm. or Asperger, they usually don't do well with metaphor. They think uh, if you're going to show them the box, the box, where is the box? I don't see the box. Right. Know, <laughs> That's a good point. Uh, so I was thinking what we can do in this kind of situation. Mm. And I remember because um, a very good friend of mine who is a computer scientist, mm. she has Asperger. So I was thinking, how did she learn this? <laughs> <laughs> how did they teach it to her? Mm -hmm. So in, I have very limited experience with uh, that. I've worked with maybe two people who had Asperger's. Um, in my experience, explaining the abstract concepts to them slowly mm -hmm. is enough. Yeah. They can just, they just, they just pick up stuff faster. Yeah. Um, okay. But yeah, metaphors confuse the shit out of them. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why, and that's another thing I should add to the presentation. Um, you don't want to teach in just one way, right? Like, again, we have time, space, narrative, right? You can mix and match these, right? You can use metaphors sometimes. You can not use it other times. Um, you could even use sound. Uh, but in my experience, that's a bit harder and a bit less effective. Uh, but maybe for some people, it works better. Um, but don't. For example, with the 
variable metaphor, that's not my only metaphor, right? Because maybe that metaphor doesn't work for someone. Or I also, like I gave that brief description before trying the metaphor, right? I can explain it in very literal terms, right? Or I could even go and explain it like how it works in memory and why the size of the box matters if we're going to the metaphor or why I need to declare what type of data it is so the computer knows how much space to reserve in memory, right? And then basically reference that memory via a pointer, right? I can explain it very literally, very directly. It's all abstract concepts, but that kind of goes, ties back into knowing your audience. Because if you explain something in one way and you still see a bunch of people like, like this, they're like, hmm, that did not work for that person. <laughs> and then you try a different way, right? Um, but yeah, good point. So actually there is a certain rule hmm. uh, about programming or IT uh, skills. Hmm. That book is usually uh, contain a lot of graphical uh, explanation about this like kind of uh, the variable, the memory, mm -hmm. things like that. The, the graphical uh, representation, right? So that th that kind of book is uh, out there. So maybe you can say that is a metaphor or just a graphical representation about how it works internally. Yeah. So yeah, here we go. So. That's a very good point, um, and that's actually a weakness of mine. That's a, that is a great, great, great strategy. I messed up by not including that in the presentation. That should absolutely be in here. Thank you, Tom. Use visual aids. Absolutely use visual aids. Going back to all the neuroscience and anthropological stuff that I mentioned, right? We are very visual. There's a reason we use light for this instead of just sound, right? There's a reason we like to look at things when we study them rather than just listening five, 10, 20 times over and over again. Most of the time, some people are different. But using visual aids is a huge, huge, huge help. So yeah, thank you, Tom. But yeah, you can do, that's interesting. No, I just noticed the waviness. It's probably, that thing is generating heat in the cold room. Um, I'm having attention problems today. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, guys. Uh, Right, so you could explain variables in this way as well, right? Using visual aids and kind of, it's still abstract, but it's making it at least a little bit more concrete without using metaphor, right? So there's, there's all these different ways you can mix, mix and match stuff. And what you'll find as you teach things is you're gonna be stronger with some things than others, right? So for example, I'm really good with spatial, right? Because that's how my brain works, right? That's why I don't do a whole bunch of visual aids visual aid stuff because in my head I'm constructing 3D objects according to what I imagine to how their properties manifest in my meat block over here um, whereas some people are much better with this and a great teacher which I am not yet but I'm getting there would know that weakness and make sure to shore it up with other methods as well okay so yeah good point Tom thank you for that
maybe I, IT environment. Mm -hmm. So even though I explain in detail and again and again, mm -hmm. she doesn't understand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so that brings up a good point, yeah. right? When you're teaching, you're not teaching at kind of perfect resolution, right? You cannot give an absolutely accurate representation of whatever you're trying to teach. It's just not possible. The only way to have a completely accurate representation of the thing is to either directly observe the thing or directly do the thing, right? And that's something that you should acknowledge, right? So for example, in the beginning I said, hey, this is not perfect, right? I'm not an expert, there will be gaps. Your mileage may vary, right? You may have different experiences. Like you want to acknowledge that and you want to set the expectation that there is more to learn. Just by coming to this class, you're not gonna magically be able to teach, right? Um, and that's, you kind of see that with university too, right? Like a college graduate is not gonna just walk into the office and be able to do the job immediately, right? There's more detailed implementation things they're gonna have to figure out how to do. Um, and it's definitely worthwhile to kind of set that expectation and encourage the audience to like, go try the thing. Go try doing it, go practice it. So yeah, that's a good point, Tom. thank you. Yeah, actually, uh, when I uh, saw the today's topic, mm -hmm. the title how to teach. Mm -hmm. teach uh, so I imagine this uh, lecture is more around how to use metaphor more efficiently, more effectively. Mm -hmm. So because to make uh, other people understand better, mm -hmm. we have to maybe use some kind of I don't know, maybe analogy or metaphor mm -hmm. uh, in, in a better way. Mm -hmm. So yes, I imagine like that. Because all the, the IT, especially the programming or the IT world, is everything is just a abstract. Yeah. You can't see. Mm -hmm. We just have to imagine. Mm -hmm. So it's really difficult to teach and make uh, people understand. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, no, that, that's absolutely right. Um, in terms of teaching how to use metaphors, I think there's always limitation because our prior experience is all different. So we try to find the most general thing that we could kind of consider that our assumptions can start from the same place. But since like, our emotional experiences with that example or what we kind of actually learn or get to know about that is like slightly different. Mm -hmm. So I think there's always like a little bit of medication. Mm -hmm. Even though it might help, it, mm -hmm. it would be maybe very, very easy choice mm -hmm. to explain something, mm -hmm. but it, it might not cover like hundred percent as you want to deliver. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that's a good point. So with oddly enough, with programming, it's a little bit easier, which is a bit crazy to say, but a lot of software is modeled after things in the work, real world, right? So like object-oriented programming, for example, is directly meant to model the real world, right? So in those cases, metaphor can work pretty well, but yeah, uh, you're definitely gonna have imperfect metaphors, um, They and everyone's experience is gonna vary. I'm mostly just repeating what you said for the recording. Um, and each person is gonna have a different level of experience with whatever subject you choose for your metaphor, right? Um, so again, it's gonna be imperfect precision. So there, the ways to kind of work with that, there's, in my mind, there's two strategies that I've used is one, spend a lot of time preparing, make sure you pick a really good metaphor, right? That maps one-to-one -one on as many relevant items as much as you can or make sure that your metaphor is very strictly constrained to one area, right? Where the relationship between the metaphor and the subject matter is very direct and very clear and very unambiguous, right? And very obvious to people who aren't super experienced with the metaphor. For example, if I start explaining programming in terms of a car, right? Maybe you don't drive. Or maybe you've only driven a couple of times. So that would be something to be careful with. Or maybe you know a little bit about cars, but then if I extend the metaphor to go into like changing the oil of the car, 
or how an internal combustion engine works, maybe it fits what I'm explaining well, but at that point you're lost, right? Um, so yeah, that's a really good point. Uh, choosing metaphor is really hard, which is why when, when Tom mentioned like, I was hoping to learn about how to construct metaphors, I was like, oh shit. <laughs> um, it's not easy and it takes a lot of creativity um, and a lot of kind of trial and error, honestly. Um, but this is getting away from the teaching stuff a little bit. Um, I'm a firm believer that smart people seek a variety of experiences. So if, if you want to teach people, right, you're going to need to use a lot of metaphor, right? And you gotta be smart because teaching is hard, right? So if you seek a whole bunch of different experiences, right, you can add more sources for metaphors. Now, that might sound like it would kind of backfire a little bit because, you know, maybe other people haven't experienced that thing that you want to use as a metaphor. But oftentimes you can just explain a little bit of extra detail and it's enough for them to make the connection. That was really abstract. Um, so for example, let's say, Scott, let's say I'm using skydiving as, a, skydiving as an example. Who here has gone skydiving? <laughs> no one, right? I've gone skydiving once. Never again, dear God. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you're familiar with the idea of skydiving. Right? You know, like, okay, you jump out of a plane, you pull the parachute, cool, right? You're familiar with the basic concept? So I can just add the little bit of detail that you need to use the metaphor directly. For example, if we're talking about learning programming, and programming being a very terrifying experience, right? Because it's just full of failure. Like, 90% of programming is failure. It's, it's miserable if you're not comfortable with failure. But if you treat programming like skydiving, right? When you first start out skydiving, they don't just send you out of a plane alone, right? You get paired with someone who's very experienced, who knows how things can go wrong, who can help guide you through any problems, like if your chute fails to pull or whatever, right? And they literally strap you to the person, right? And you jump out of a plane together and you cannot be separated. And that person takes care of you. They're knowledgeable. Right? They know how to do this thing and they can make sure you're safe. Right? And I could say that, you know, programming, if you want a good experience learning programming, do it like skydiving. Right? Find someone that you can treat as a mentor, someone who can take care of you when things go wrong, right? Who can help you if you feel like you've broken your computer, right? And basically rely on them to help take care of you. Right? And that's what this community can be, right? So in that example, Right? You didn't know, you've never gone skydiving before. Maybe you didn't know that your first time skydiving, they strapped someone to you right, to help you jump out of the plane. But by just adding that one piece of information, then the metaphor works. Right? And it's a small enough piece of information that you can just absorb it immediately and it's fine. Right? So that's a bit of a tangent. But even if metaphors, even if people don't have direct experience with a metaphor, you can still kind of enrich it a little bit by describing the parts of it that are relevant to get your point across. Does that make sense? Not very proud of that explanation because <laughs> it like took that. way too long. Because but like when you give more details, that already set up some kind of context. Mm. So that they kind of, and then, so if at that moment, like an overall like audience will kind of create the same experience. Yeah, that's a very good point. Did you guys hear that? No? Uh, so she said she, she kind of likes this strategy of kind of enriching an example metaphor um, because it establishes the context like we talked about before. And it also provides kind of a shared experience for the people involved because maybe other people didn't know that either. And it provides a way to kind of bond everything together. Is that, yeah. Does that make sense? Yes. So for now, I understand like uh, you are uh, act, like active 
for the teaching as in the building really like good luck for, for the people who want to learn. Mm -hmm. So I think that's like how we can really take care of the learning. Mm -hmm. And but as a like kind of teacher when you prepare some materials and you might have some direction or goals, but it might always not go the way you expect it because there may be questions that are unexpected or people who intro and then bring out their ideas. Mm -hmm. So What's your, how do you set your goals and how do you, uh, what do you try, what you have to choose one mm -hmm. like in the middle of your class, mm -hmm. like uh, how, what, what do you usually do? And mm -hmm. So there's, there's a few strategies to handle that. So for example, um, an agenda really helps, uh, especially if you lay it out the be at the beginning. Um, because you can say like, hey, that is interesting. I want to talk about that more and we can learn more about it, but this is the stuff I told everyone I was gonna teach. This is kind of what we agreed to and I have to make sure this is covered first, right? So if you're pressed for time, you can use that strategy. But I would treat that as kind of a last resort, right? Like that should be your lowest priority option. Um, and only do that if you don't think you have time, right? Ideally you wanna, allow some buffer time during your teaching session. Um, when it comes to, so, so if, if, I, if I remember your question correctly, there was like kind of two parts to it. One was that it was off topic, and two was that maybe you as an instructor are not familiar with it? No, no, it's like you have certain goals for teaching. Mm -hmm. Like by the end of the course, mm -hmm. you wish maybe you want to cover certain things. Mm -hmm. But like because of somehow the class, like you know, or mm -hmm. the situations, mm -hmm. like the time, okay. like, you know, we don't know. So that's um, that's tricky. If you're a bit neurotic, it actually helps <laughs> um, because, like, I instinctively check my watch all the time. Like, what time is it? What time is it? And that actually helps because then I can be like, hey, I still have. Oh, another thing too is. I'm not gonna turn this towards you because uh, then you'll be in the recording. But if you turn on presentation mode, it tells you you're on slide 16 of 18, right? That can also help you go like, oh, I'm like almost done or I'm halfway through or I'm still at the beginning. And you can compare that with your time to determine, do I need to cut this off or can we continue? And in the event that you have to cut things off, you can re uh, refer to the agenda like, hey, we still have this stuff I gotta teach. You guys should definitely talk about this, but I promised you folks I would teach you this. We need to move forward. Um, and then be like, but hey, after the class, you should totally talk about that because that's really interesting and I'm curious too. If you are, if you're not, don't say that. But Because um, you know, you want people to be comfortable with it. Um, but if it's already beyond time, it gets trickier, right? Like if you've already used up more of your time budget than you're able to, you can skip some things uh, depending on if you feel like they can find that information quickly on their own. But then at the end, to be like, hey, look, we didn't cover this, this, and this. It's referenced in the presentation. You can go Google it on your own time. I'm sorry we were getting short on time, but I'm confident you can learn that on your own now that you've been exposed to it. Um, or maybe you can just run a little late. Um, not a good solution, but I've used it a few times. Um, it's especially helpful if like, you promise you're gonna buy food for people afterwards, then they're much more okay with being a little bit late. Unless they're getting hangry, then you have a problem. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, you could also just kind of move faster, or you could um, not check for questions as often. Like I've done that sometimes, where you know, normally I check for questions at the end of each slide, as you probably noticed today. But if I was in a hurry, I just go to the next slide, right? Because uh, questions take up a lot of time. So does that answer your question? Cool. Others? Speaking of hangry. Um, yeah, so I think uh, that about covers today. Um, thank you guys for the discussion, because you did capture a couple of parts that were missing from the presentation. I'll make sure to add them for whenever we eventually do this one again.
Um, but I hope it was helpful. I hope that you folks learned about how to kind of tailor to your audience, kind of how memory works and how to use that to your advantage when constructing knowledge, and then kind of taking care of like your audience's attention and these kinds of things. So, and if there's anything, so I love this topic because it's what I do in my spare time without being paid to do it. So if you want to talk with me about this or if you find something cool, I would love to hear it. Um, and as always, we're on Discord or if you want my cacao or anything, that's cool too. Uh, so yeah, thank you guys. And...